one of the great characters of the sport. Born in Dungog, New South Wales, he loved to smoke, loved to drink, but he could seriously play. He played 74 tests and scored 15 centuries. His name is Doug Walters and he is a cricket legend. Well, welcome, Dougie. Good to see you. Nice to be with you, Robert. You, you were famously known as the man who loved a beer, a bet and a smoke, but we've had to rework that sentence because the smokes are no more, are they? No, the smokes are long gone now, actually. Five and a half years on the third of this month it was, so, uh, yep, they're gone. And um, one of the easiest things ever done. Isn't that extraordinary because you were, you were a 50 smoker day man for a lot of years. Would that be right? Well, that's where if I slept in and uh, <laughs> went to bed very early, I was, I was down to 50. But, uh, yeah, I climbed out a little bit higher than 50 on, um, on most occasions. Doug, how, how did it happen? Like, how, how did you manage to kick the habit? Well, uh, I'm a good friend of Jack Newton's, and Jack Newton had this laser treatment. And Jack and I were in A grade, I guess, at drinking and smoking. Most days, we'd be down at the golf club into it. And Jack had this treatment, and uh, I thought, uh, that's interesting. He, he, he's been off the smokes. I said, if you're off the cigarettes for, for three weeks, I said, get your, your wife to ring me. Well, three weeks later, he rang me. I said, no, I need a Jackie to ring me, not you. He said, yeah, I know that. He said, but my mate wants to have a crack at you next. I said, oh, I don't need to give him away, Jack. I said, I'm only on the mild ones. You were on the heavy ones. You had to give him away. I said, he said, I said, anyway, get him, get him and give me a ring. I wouldn't mind going to have a look at the treatment that you had. So a couple of minutes later, he, he rung me and um, said, come in tomorrow. So um, I went in the next, next morning and um, he said, you're here. He said, you might as well have the treatment. I said, no, I don't want the treatment. I said, I just want to have a look at the treatment. He said, you're here, have the treatment. And being the coward that I am, I said, uh, does it hurt? Because <laughs> it's taken the place of uh, Chinese acupuncture. Uh, this laser method, and he said, no, it doesn't hurt. So I had the treatment, and uh, I'm lying there on the couch, and this lady's doing all this, this stuff, and I think, I wish she'd hurry up so I could get downstairs to have a smoke. <laughs> I still had my smokes in my pocket, and I got downstairs, and I didn't feel like a cigarette. I thought, oh, I'll wait till I get home now. I got home, I didn't feel like one. I'll wait till tomorrow. Well, i waited five and a half years and a little over now and I haven't felt like one, so. It, it is extraordinary. Did it take you long to adjust to not being a smoker? I'd imagine your hand would have been, you know, just almost ready for it, wouldn't it? Or... Well, no, it, it's, it was the strangest thing. And, I mean, it's, as I said, it's one of the easiest things I've ever done was, was give away smoking. The next morning I had a cup of coffee and that's normally when I started smoking. Um, and I thought there's something missing here. And that's the only time I ever thought about it. Mm. And I mean, I didn't miss it when I was having a beer. Um, I still haven't missed it. It's interesting because we worked out that you would have had around about 270,000 cigarettes in, in your life. And if you put them end to end, it'd be about 30 kilometres, about 10 Melbourne cups. <laughs> well, my mate was trying to work out how much I should have saved uh, the other day. And he, he got to 142 million, but he, he put on <laughs> a couple of extra noughts somewhere along the line. <laughs> but it's amazing. do you feel better for it? Well, uh, as I say, I'm still alive, yeah. so I must, I must feel better for it. Yeah. Doug, we spoke to some of your old teammates about your playing style, and they said when Doug hit the ball sweetly, it almost sounded like a cannon crack, and yet your bat was as light as a feather, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a very small uh, light bat. I had two pound three, uh, two pound four was a heavy bat for me. You played Sheffield Shield cricket at 17 and Test cricket at 19, and all this after being raised on a dairy farm at Dungog, where... You know, there was no academy training then, was not I can only imagine. How did your skills develop so quickly? Well, um, I, I guess all my junior cricket, I, I was a bowler. I mean, I didn't know I could bat. And we very seldom had to chase more than, well, I don't recall chasing any more than 20 at, at any in any match. And I used to bat seven or eight, so uh, I didn't get too many hits, obviously. So I had to concentrate on the bowling. But um, when I, I started to to get a, a little bit uh, a go with the bat and uh, I thought uh, this cape is not so bad uh, so uh, yeah I, I guess it was uh, the batting that I didn't know about. Uh, mm. It's incredible that you could not be a specialist batsman I mean, batting almost mid to lower order 
and be a test player against England at 19, isn't it, really? Oh, yeah, the rise was uh, was very quick. I mean, um, yeah, I, I guess uh, you don't have no, nerves in those days when, you, when you're a young guy. And, um, yeah. and you grew up in the era before cricket was televised, uh, but the radio images, you always said, were very strong and, and helped you. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I say to the kids when I'm coaching that uh, I learned to play cricket watching through the radio. And they say, uh, you, you mean listening through the radio, don't you? And I said, no, I mean watching through the radio. I, um, the commentators were a, a little different, I guess, in those days. They, they uh, emphasised every movement a bowler had and every stutter on his run-up or whatever he may have had. And it came in very handy for me because I, I actually faced a couple of those guys that I'd heard about on the radio or watched on the radio and I'd be batting against them in a test match and I'd be smiling when they're halfway through their run-up coming in a bowl of first ball to me. I think, gee, how good did I get this bloke right? Because we used to practice those guys on the, on the side veranda out in the backyard uh, and we'd, we'd bowl accordingly. Can you remember the precise moment uh, when you found out you were playing a test for Australia? Oh, absolutely. I, uh, I was uh, driving past Paddington uh, Post Office uh, the 8 o'clock news came on and uh, my father was in the car with me at the time and um, he said pull over and we'll listen to uh, the team because the, the team had just been announced and of course uh, Walt was starting with a W we had to wait for uh, right to the end of the, the team selection and yeah that was that was something very very special. Did you think. crown it with a coldy Doug? You wouldn't have been uh, allowed to would you? Well not in those days. I don't think I was even drinking in those days believe it or not. The amazing thing about your first test was you were 19 years old and you actually had a Doug Walters autograph bat to walk out to bat with, isn't it? Which would be just unheard of today, wouldn't it? A 19 year old kid with his <laughs> own autograph bat line. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. Yeah, I worked for a sports, a sports company and um, they had their own brand. So um, they, uh, they made sure that uh, they had a Doug Walters bat. And, and the, the second ball of the innings, you skipped down the wicket to the spinners and you just looked very comfortable. Were you or were you very nervous? And when you're 19, you don't, you don't have the nerves that you get in life a little bit later. And, and you always believe to get off the mark, whether it's a test match or a, a game in the backyard. So Donald was waiting at the top of the steps and uh, Richie come down from the press box and dived in ahead of uh, Sir Donald and shook my hand and said, congratulations, don't sign a thing until you see me. Uh, Richie was uh, sort of my father. And, and still is in many ways. And uh, Sir Donald uh, said, congratulations, have you ever had any problems uh, with your cricket? Don't be afraid to come and see me. Well, I immediately thought, uh, he's a chairman of selectors, why would I go and see him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Did you ever? No, I didn't. And I, I, never, uh, I never saw anybody uh, take it because he, he did avail himself to, uh, to lots and lots of players that I think just the awe of uh, Bradman himself that I don't think anyone was game to go and ask him or talk about the finer points of cricket. Yeah. He liked you. It was quite clear in a lot of his public comments. And uh, did you get any feeling of who he was as a person at all? Uh, well, he, he was... I always got along very, very well with, with Sir Donald. I mean, after I'd finished playing cricket, I was over in Adelaide for a test match and, and the English team uh, were about to play two days before the Adelaide Test began, we're at some function and Sir so Donald walked up to the English team manager and said, uh, what are you boys doing tomorrow? He said, well, they're practising tomorrow afternoon about three o'clock, but nothing until then. He said, well, I'd like to have them out uh, to my place for morning tea. And he said, oh, Sir so Donald, I'd love that. And he turned around and he saw me standing behind him. He said, Doug, he said, if you're not doing anything tomorrow, he said, you can come too. I said, thank you, Sir so Donald, I'll be first there. So I was first there, and 10 o'clock, um, Lady Jessie had all the scones and everything, the tea all beautifully decorated out. The English team bus pulled up. They, they converged on, on uh, Sir Donald, the, particularly the, the fast bowlers. They got him up against his, his back wall, and they, they said to him, Sir Donald, we, would you score as many runs today if you were facing these West Indian fast bowlers that they've got. And he answered the question, I think the best answer I've ever heard in, from a, anybody. 
he said, oh, you've got to take into consideration a lot of things have changed since I played cricket. He said, the wickets are nowhere near as good as they used to be. Field placings are all different. Your restrictions on the leg side. The captains do their homework a lot better than what they, they used to do. He said, but uh, no, he said, uh, to answer your question, he said, and I can see these blokes rubbing their hands together thinking they've got him. They've got him. <laughs> he said, to answer your question, he said, no. He said, I wouldn't score as many runs as I scored in my day. He said, but I'd still score a lot more than the bloke that comes second. <laughs> <Very> <laughs> Which I thought was fantastic. Stick. Soon after that first test, you signed a bat contract worth £1,000 a year. That's a lot of money for a young kid in those days. Well, that must have felt like a king's ransom, did it? Well, it certainly was. I mean, I, I think I was getting £4.10 a week in, in those days. So uh, to sign a contract like that was uh, unbelievable. And, and at the time, it was uh, the, the dearest uh, contract that anyone had signed, bat contract that anyone had signed in Australia. So, uh, yeah, it, it did seem like a lot of money. money. Then something extraordinary happened. You were the pride of Australia, a 19-year-old who'd scored centuries in his first two tests, and then you were conscripted by the army and just disappeared for two years. It's an amazing story, isn't it? Well, yeah, that's um, something that had to be done, I, I guess. Uh, well, something that I probably could have done without at the time, um, going into national service. But uh, I guess um, if my marble come out of the hat, uh, <laughs> I had to accept the fact that uh, I wasn't going to dodge the issue. One in 12 20-year-old males were drafted. Your name came out. The, the huge pop singer of the day, Normie Rose, came out. Bob Fulton, the rugby league star, his name came out. And there was just a suggestion that they'd been almost deliberately plucked out. Did you have any theories on that? Well, no one else had a birthday on the 21st of December. So uh, that wasn't certainly done on, uh, on date of births. Um, so I expect that my name was deliberately pulled out and probably other guys as well. What about the day when you found out your heart just must have slid through the soles of your shoes, did it? Or Well, yeah, I, I guess um, Vietnam was uh, the, the big issue in those days. I mean, I, I don't think anyone was busting uh, their soles to get uh, overseas on, the, on that, that sort of a tour. And uh, fortunately, I didn't have to um, go to Vietnam. But uh, yeah, I think that was the only the only thing that uh, was a little bit uh, disturbing. Did the prospect of going to Vietnam scare you? Uh, not not exactly scare me, but uh, I would have been feeling a lot safer at home, I can tell you that. Stay there, Dougie. After the break, the day that Kerry Packer bounced Doug Walters. After 20 tests, Doug, you're averaging 67 and people were calling you the young Bradman. And, uh, you know, there was a nice symmetry, wasn't there? A boy from the bush, a sort of a quite a shy lad. Uh, how did you handle all that? Well, I, I knew, uh, certainly knew there was only ever going to be one Bradman. So, uh, yeah, it was just water off a duck's back. You were renowned as the sort of cricketer who could have a big night out and still perform the next day. And, of course, most famously was your 250 against New Zealand at Christchurch when you were staying at the Avon Motor Inn. <laughs> now, well, tell us about that night. Well, I, I guess, uh, I guess when, you, when you have a few drinks of a night, you, you've, got to, you've got to show, you've got to prove to your mates that uh, you can actually do the job the next day. I mean, if, um, if you had a night uh, out on the, on the aisle and, um, and couldn't perform the next day, then... Um, that would, that would really get into you. But I guess that's, that's what I had to do. I had to convince those guys that uh, uh, it didn't affect me. The, the alcohol didn't affect me. And I don't think it affected me as much as it did some other people. But, yeah, I guess uh, we had a little bit of a celebration drink after I would got to 100 that, that first night. My roommate, Kerry O'Keefe, wasn't very happy with me. He, he wasn't very happy with Gary Gilmore, who was not out at the time as well. He said, uh, you blacks are a disgrace to yourselves, to your team, to your country. I'm going to be in at two minutes past 11 tomorrow. Get to bed, you guys. <laughs> so I think when Kerry finally come in uh, just before tea, um, he got run out. Uh, he claims I run him out deliberately, but uh, I'm sure he run himself out. Uh, but he had to walk past me, and it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. I'd, 
I couldn't help myself. I had a, I broke out laughing. And I said to him on the way back, I said, are you going to have a drink with us tonight, Kerry? <laughs> <laughs> so Kerry's certainly never forgotten that. So what time would you have got to bed that morning? Oh, uh, I, I don't know. The, the bar had shut uh, a reasonable time, I guess, one o'clock. And we were just going to have a nightcap out of our little mini bar in the room, but uh, Kerry couldn't see the funny side of that. Did you have uh, many days, Doug, where you were you'd go out to bat and and you were still a bit under the weather from the night before? Or well, I don't know, I don't know whether it was under the weather, but um, probably, probably, yes, helps your confidence. I think a, a, a couple of beers. I mean, it, perhaps I hadn't quite worn off uh, all all that time, but. A cricket, cricket is uh, pretty lucky because you don't you don't start work until eleven o'clock. I mean, uh, so most of the most of the beer should have been worn off by eleven o'clock. And there's so many stories uh, about you, but uh, one of the ones I, I smiled at was when was it true that you once got home at eight o'clock and wanted an eight thirty wake up call? Was that true? Well, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't deny that being the truth. I would say that that probably happened a couple of times. Because it's hardly worth getting the half hour, although, <laughs> what do you think? Well, half hour is better than nothing. Now, Doug, in doing our research, we uh, found some lovely footage of your wife and your mum, and uh, what really shines through is that country sincerity. And I'll, I'll just get you to, to reflect on, on, on this. I can't just remember what age he got his first cricket bat, but he was always keen, always wanting to play cricket. He was telling us earlier today that you weren't a bad cricketer yourself at one stage. They used, they used to put me in this wicket keep because I said the ball couldn't get past me. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline, being an international cricketer puts a lot of demands on a domestic situation. For example, Doug being away overseas a lot. How have you handled that situation? Um, well, I've been lucky enough to have travelled with him to some extent. Um, other than that, prior to our son being born, I worked. So I always felt that I had a lot to keep me busy. Caroline was talking about going on tour with you, but it couldn't have been easy for her. I mean, that was an era when the women were really treated poorly on tour, the partners and wives, weren't they? Yeah, they were. I and mean, uh, they couldn't travel on the same transport or stay in the same hotel. So, uh, yeah, it made, made life pretty difficult. So how did you arrange it, Doug? Like, if Caroline went to England, how would you link up with her? Oh, well, I'd, I'd stay in her hotel, but she couldn't She couldn't stay in, in the, the hotel at that we were staying, the team was staying in, so or well, she couldn't travel on the team bus <laughs> from A to B, so she had to get the train or other buses or whatever. So uh, yeah, there was normally one or two of the other wives with them, uh, with her. So uh, yeah, they made their they made their way around, but uh, yeah, not easily. You scored so many great Test centuries, but I guess your record in England was your one soft spot. Ashley Mallet had a theory that your reflexes were so quick you would follow the ball. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, I, I saw the ball move off the wicket instead of hitting through the line and, and missing the ball like the, the other good players did. And then I followed the ball of one of the three or four galley men, fieldsmen said thanks very much. You hooked Bob Willis for six last ball of the day in Perth in 1974. Three runs for a century in a session. And talk us through what happened. Well, I, I guess it was my day. We all have a day that uh, things tend to go right. Uh, that was one occasion. I've never give a bowlers a lot of credit, but that was um, one day that they aimed at the middle of the bat and hit it more often than they normally did. Just prior to tea, Greg Chaplett got out, and normally when two guys cross, there are only the words "good luck" and "bad luck" exchanged. But Greg said, um, "I got out so you get 100 in the last session," and I didn't even say "bad luck." I just walked straight past him. I thought, "What, what a ridiculous thing to say." I was three not out at tea. I come back into the dressing room and said, I, I said, what do you mean you got out so I can get 100 in the last session? He said, he said, yeah, he said, I, I got out so you could get 100. He, I said, you wouldn't give me a wicket away to give me a mother hit. <laughs> he said, no, he said, we need some quick runs. He said, you're the man to do it. Were you expecting a bouncer? Oh, uh, well, yes, I was because um, uh, Bob Willis had he'd been averaging four or five and over and... Um, I, uh, he'd only given me one up until that particular time, so uh, I thought, well, if he gives me another one, I'm going to have a crack at it somewhere. Part of your sort of charm was that you're a card player, weren't you, in the dressing room? And uh, were those stories actually true about you 
leaving a hand and getting up to bat. Like you would be literally batting, I'm in. Right, I just leave that there. Would that would that happen? Well, it, it didn't normally happen un unless uh, we lost a couple of quick wickets. Uh, I mean, normally when I was next in, I, I used to put the cards away for a little bit. But I um, I remember one game that we were playing in in um, Dunedin in, in New Zealand. I did have a particularly good hand. It wasn't a Test match. Uh, uh, I had a, 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 a hand that I we, we were playing crib, and I had a chance of getting twenty nine. And um, the wicket, two wickets had fallen. And I won't think I went out on a hat trick, and, but I made a, a quick cut before I um, I raced out. I think I um, I blocked the first ball to save the hat trick and slogged the next one straight up in the air and went back and cut the cards. <laughs> and I did cut in the right spot. I, I would have had 29. So <laughs> imagine trying that today, Doug. Oh. <laughs> We've found some wonderful old footage of you and your old mate Terry Jenner. Um, playing cards. We'll just have a look at it and see if it brings back some memories. Has, has a lot of skill. Seven, Wrapped eight, around a lot of luck. 27. 31. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> no reason why you should have a four there, is it? <laughs> but he's got one. <laughs> now I'll play a 60, he's probably got one of those. 16. 21. 31. Yeah, see, he's got a 10. <laughs> now, there's no logic to that hand. Have a look at it. There's just no logic to it. <laughs> what, what, what memories come back seeing that? Well, I, I guess the, the memories come back to see uh, the Coca-Cola bottle. It was Terry, Terry Jenner was uh, working for Coke at the time in the Rothmans packet <laughs> and <laughs> sitting next to one another. But, um, yeah, we had a lot of fun and filled in a lot of, uh, a lot of time, I, I guess. He looked like a card player, didn't he, Terry? He, like yeah. He just looked like a card shark, didn't he? He understood cards fairly well. What about uh, playing for Packer, Doug? You signed up. It was late in your career. Uh, was that an easy decision? It was an easy decision for me. Um, I think I was 30, 31 or 32 at the time. And it wasn't an easy decision for some of the younger guys, David Hooks and Ian Davis and those sort of guys. But, um, yeah, I, I could see that uh, my test career might, may have been finished, um, but uh, there was a little bit more security attached to it and we were still playing, we were still playing cricket against the best. Um, but it was pretty hard. Pretty hard cricket, I can tell you. You'd be one of the few people that Kerry Packer actually bowled to, wouldn't you? Well, yeah, he didn't actually bowl him. He, he threw his suitcase off after the first. This after the first season of World Series cricket. Ross Edwards and I were were having problems with a short pitch ball, like a lot of other guys, I guess. And um, he took us into Barry Knight's cricket school in uh, in the city and said, uh, "I want you guys to be in there at five o'clock next Friday." Well, five past five, Kerry arrived and he threw off his suitcase and he was standing halfway down the wicket and he was trying to knock our heads off, throwing, throwing balls at us. And Barry Knight said, uh, hey, you, Kerry, you can't do that. You're going to kill one of these guys. He, he said, um, he said, well, how, how are they going to fix it? And he suggested that we should get on a squash court and throw tennis balls at one another and rather than throw cricket balls at one another, and, uh, which we did for uh, the next four or five months during the winter and you know the, twice a week every Tuesday and Thursday we booked that uh, squash court for an hour and you know there wasn't one day uh, during that four or five months that Kerry didn't ring to find out whether we were there or not so I'm sure he had a lot of interest in us guys I mean he, I don't think he was all that concerned about the two three dollars a week or whatever he was paying for the squash court. So you obviously had a bit to do with Packer. What did you make of him? Oh, I, I thought he was a, a very fair man. I mean, uh, I wouldn't have liked to have been on the wrong side of Kerry, but uh, I didn't see, I didn't see uh, anything really nasty about the man. I mean, uh, he he believed uh, in what what he wanted to do, and well, I guess he nine times out of ten he, he did get what he wanted to do, didn't he? You played the game when it was a bit more relaxed than today. Do you ever regret that, or were you happy to play when you did? I don't know. I was. Uh, I wouldn't swap anything. Um, but uh, I guess financially, it'd be you'd be uh, silly not to be trying to play these days. Uh, but no, we had we had a heap of fun, and um, I was glad to play when we did play. And who's your favourite modern cricketer? Uh, I like um, I like all our our um, top batsmen. I think uh, at, at the moment, uh, David Warner is uh, a guy that's impressed me. He's come 
from a, a 2020 player to a 50-50 to a test cricketer. Uh, I hope that he continues in the same vein that he's going. I, mean, I, I enjoy anyone that hits the ball. Could you have adjusted to today's disciplinary standards? Like if they said, Doug, no drinking during test matches, no smoking, no nothing, would you have adjusted? Oh, I, I could have done that. Yeah, I could have done that. For the rewards that uh, these guys are, are getting these days, I mean, you'd be silly enough to, wouldn't you? Doug, you still spin a great yarn and it's been terrific to have you tonight. If there's one legend of cricket in Australia, it's you, mate. Well done. Thank you, Robert. Nice to be with you.